So uh, instead, I'm going to talk about a kind of a larger, more general, a broader issue that also interests me um, that hopefully will interest uh, all of you in the room, which is really this question of exercise as medicine. So um, Brigitte did a very nice job of, of telling you who I am, but, um, uh, but really what I do in my career really is to try to combine um, anatomy and physiology in the lab with uh, field work. I have two field sites. One is in East Africa. I've been working in, in the Western Rift province in Kenya for well over uh, 12, 13 years now. And I also have now have a new field project in, in northern Mexico. So I do field work as well. Um, and then finally in the lab, we do experimental biomechanics and physiology. And I try to combine all those three uh, ways of looking at the body to answer the question, how and why are our bodies th the way they are, but also why does that matter? I'm interested in how that is relevant to health and disease. So my special interest is physical activity and the evolution of how our bodies became, uh, enabled us to become athletes. And a lot of the work I do is on running, um, but I've also done work on walking, on carrying, on throwing, on sweating, on swallowing, and chewing. And, um, and as I've done all this work, it's become really obvious to me that there's a sort of a strange paradox, right? I'm interested in how our bodies evolved to be athletes, and yet we live in a world today where, where uh, very few people actually do much athletic activity. And I, I've come to call this the exercise paradox, which is that we clearly evolved to be extremely physically active, to be, to be athletes. And yet most of us avoid physical activity whenever it's possible. And we'll get more into that later on. And just to, to give some, put some numbers to that fact. So the US Surgeon General and the American College of Sports Medicine describe an adult as physically inactive if you get less than 150 minutes of exercise a week. So that's five times a week for 30 minutes a day. And by those definitions, between 50% and 75% of American adults are inactive, physically inactive. They're defined as sedentary. And children need an hour of physical activity a day, according to the US Surgeon General. And there the d numbers are also equally depressing. About two-thirds of our, of our children in the United States today do not get enough physical activity. So why is this the case? Why, are we, why did we evolve to be active, and, and yet so many of us are now inactive, even though we all know it's good for us, right? So there are lots of people trying to study this, um, and the vast majority of people trying to study this um, are, are in the fields of psychology and sports medicine, et cetera. And there's nothing wrong with those fields. They're all very important fields. Economists are interested in this. Um, but I'm an evolutionary biologist, and I think that evolutionary biology also has uh, an important role. In fact, I would argue that it has an essential role to contributing to this question. And I would like to uh, kind of base my, my talk today on a, on, a, on a very famous uh, essay by Theodosius Dobzhansky. He was a very important geneticist um, uh, following the World War. He was in Chicago. He, anybody of you work on fruit flies is to do population genetics is because of Dobzhansky, right? And Dobzhansky, this is, by the way, it's not Dobzhansky, that's Darwin, uh, wrote a very famous essay in 1972 entitled, Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. And recently, there's been a growing movement to apply uh, Dobzhansky's uh, phrase to medicine, right, and health, and that nothing in biology, including health and disease, makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I'm going to try to explain to you not only why that's important, but also why it's essential, and hopefully you all leave the room fervent evolutionary medicine types. Okay, so, so let's, uh, in this lecture, let's try to use the framework of evolutionary medicine to address the exercise paradox. And I'll sort of define, define the talk into three sections. One is to define the problem. Then we'll talk about why does the problem exist. And then finally, very briefly at the end, we'll try to ask how an evolutionary perspective might come up with different solutions than, than other perspectives. So let's first uh, look at what the problem is. And I'm going to give you some depressing facts. You probably know them all, but it never hurts to remind ourselves just how bad things are, right? So we spend more money than any other country in the world on health care, right? So in 2013, last year for which we have really good data, we spent almost $3 trillion in the U.S. We spent more than $9,000 per person. That's an average on health care. And it consumes almost 18% of our entire GDP. And yet for all that money, we get really very, very poor results, right? We are 39th in the world in terms of infant mortality. We're 43rd in the world in terms of adult male mortality and 42nd in the world in terms of adult female mortality. Clearly, we are not getting value for our money, and that asks some que questions. And one, of course, the biggest is why are we spending so much money and getting such bad health care? 
And there are lots of causes out there, and so the ones that you read about a lot of the time in the newspaper, and they're not, these are not wrong. We have a high administrative costs in the US, we have high priced services, we have a lot of unnecessary care, and very importantly, we have a lot of income inequality in terms of who gets access to health care. But there's a fourth, there's a fifth problem, right, which, um, which is getting a lot of attention, and that is the fact that more people are getting older, right? So people are living longer, and as a result, they're getting more, um, more people are getting sick from chronic and non-infectious diseases, right? And that's um, a very common explanation you read in the literature. To put that into perspective, when FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, signed the Social Security Act in 1935, the average um, life expectancy of an American was 63. When Obama signed the Affordable Care Act uh, into, into law in 2010, the average life expectancy of an American was 82. That's significant progress. And the way in which most people in the medical world think about that is something called the epidemiological transition. So, uh, so this is a graph of the epidemiological transition. We have time on the, on the x-axis and death and illness on the y-axis. And over the last 50, 100 years, advances in medicine and sanitation and, and, and government and various other sort of factors in our lives have caused a rapid and quite remarkable decrease in illness and mortality that comes from infectious diseases as well as malnutrition. Very few of us in the room are really worried about dying from smallpox or influenza or, or all those kinds of diseases that used to be the major killer of Americans. But at the same time, there's been a concomitant increase in non-infectious diseases, right? So we, now the number one killer of Americans is heart disease. The number two killer is, um, is, a, is, is cancer, uh, diabetes, osteoporosis. The list is very long. The things that make us mostly worried about how we age and get old um, has, has risen. And again, the major story of this is that as people live longer, they're more likely to get these non-infectious diseases. That's the standard story in the medical literature. Um, and this causes what's called an extension of morbidity, a, a phrase that I believe was first coined by, by Jim Fries at Stanford. And, but basically, prior to the epidemiological transition, people lived shorter lives, but the proportion of time they spent ill at the end of their lives was much shorter. And as people have now been living longer, uh, we, have, we live longer at a healthy, for a healthier state, but we also have a proportionately larger amount of time that we spend ill prior to the time that we die. And this is well documented. This is not controversial data. And those illnesses are expensive, right? Here's, a, here's some data on what the average cost is for those illnesses. So uh, cardiovascular disease costs an average of you know, $19,000 per patient per year. Um, Type 2 diabetes costs 8,000, arthritis 6,000, 6, et cetera. As, you know, so you add up all these costs, you come up with easily with trillions of dollars of, 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 of cost, right? So, we're, so a lot of the, end, the, the money that we're spending is on these diseases, these non-infectious diseases that accrue as we get older. And if you think the problem is bad in the United States, wait till you look around the world, right? We have a developing time bomb. As the rest of the world is developing, um, these diseases are, are rapidly rising around the world in countries that are even less equipped than the United States to handle um, these diseases. So this is a graph from a recent paper in Nature showing what the expected increases in just type 2 diabetes are. Remember, diabetes is sort of a very useful kind of, it's kind of like the canary in the coal mine. When diabetes rates go up, that means every other metabolic disease is going up. And you can see, for example, in India, they project by 2030, over 100 million people in India will have type 2 diabetes. But how is India going to pay for that cost? How is China going to pay for that cost? How is Brazil going to pay for that cost? This is a serious worldwide global health problem. Now, to a lot of people, the standard sort of thought about this is, well, this is the price of progress, right? I mean, if you're not going to die young from smallpox or, or polio, um, I'd rather die old from, you know, heart disease or, or diabetes or osteoporosis, right? It seems like a pretty reasonable um, uh, a trade off to make. But I think that that logic is actually suffers from several serious problems. The first is that we're confusing diseases that occur more commonly with age and diseases that are actually caused by old age. You know, old age doesn't necessarily cause you to have a lot of these diseases that I'll try to show you in a second. And, and this is a very common and really actually a I think, pernicious way of thinking in the public health and medical literature. And the second is that, you know, the CDC and WHO and various other organizations, when they try to estimate which, what percentage of these diseases are actually preventable, the estimates are all very high. And I think a common consensus number, and this is not a number pulled out of a hat, this is actually CDC data, which is not in the you know, the, the game of trying to be alarmist about this sort of stuff, 
they, you know, 75% of the diseases that we're talking about are, are classified by the CDC as preventable. So we're spending $3 trillion on, dis on, 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 on diseases, 75% of which shouldn't have to happen in the first place, according to our, uh, our, 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 uh, our government. Now, again, the way in which most people think about this is this non-evolutionary view of the epidemiological transition, right? Infectious diseases go down and concomitantly non-infectious diseases go up. But as an evolutionary biologist, I, th I look at the data differently. I, to me, it's a bit like looking at a football game and trying to understand what happened from just the last minute of the game, right? I mean, you'll know the score, but you'll have no clue why the score was that way, right? And to really understand why the picture is the way it is, you have to look further back in time. And let's start with the Paleolithic. So for the vast majority of the Paleolithic period, <coughs> we know that chronic infectious chronic non-infectious diseases were at very low levels. This is just, these are made up, you know, there's no numbers on this x-axis, on the y-axis, right? I'm just making, but this is not an unreasonable um, model, right? And we know that infectious diseases were more common, right? But they probably were co common on a sort of a fairly low level. And then with the f agricultural revolution, people started living with their animals. They started living in permanent settlements where, there's, where they're, where they're <coughs> accumulating waste and being ar you know, around their waste constantly in higher population densities. We have abundant data, some of it coming from here in Amherst, right, that, um, that, that the, with the agricultural revolution, infectious disease rates just skyrocketed around the world. And most of the diseases that we really care about today are diseases that became common or evolved actually since the origins of farming. So infectious diseases are actually a very recent problem. And it's only with the industrial era, with sanitation and medicine and various other advances, that those infectious disease rates fell precipitously. But at the same time, as I've mentioned before, chronic non-infectious diseases have been rising since the in origins of industrialization. But one of the questions you have to ask is, are they necessary, right? Are these diseases a concomitant increase, uh, you know, uh, product of, the, of, the, of this epidemiological transition? And people who look at the health of hunter-gatherers, people who don't live modern, developed lives, routinely, inevitably, find that the answer to that question is no. This is some broad brush data. There's no data here. These are just statements. Um, but there's plenty of data to back them up, which is that hunter-gatherers tend to live pretty healthy lives if they survive childhood. They have high child mortality rates. That's absolutely true. But they don't live at high population densities. They don't live with farm animals. They move frequently. They don't have a lot of sanitation concerns, et cetera. Um, th they have naturally a very uh, healthy diet, um, uh, low, in, low in processed foods, high in fiber, very nutritious diets. Um, and they get a lot of physical activity. Your average hunter-gatherer uh, female <coughs> walks uh, about five miles a day. The average hunter-gatherer male walks about 10 miles a day. They don't have to work crazy hard. They work about four to six hours a day. Um, they have um, naturally pretty healthy lives. There's lots of data on this. <coughs> Let me just show you uh, one uh, study, because uh, I've actually become very recently interested in, in heart disease, and we're doing a lot of research uh, with some colleagues who are cardiologists on, on heart disease in some of these populations. So this is a very famous data set. Um, so this is a, this is a, so most people in medical school learn that it's natural for your blood pressure to rise with age. In fact, medical students are taught that's just normal. Right? As people get older, their blood pressure rises, right? And here's some standard data. This is from Brits in London, right? So when you're young, you're 117 over 70, and by the time you're in your 70s, you're 186 over 90. These are averages, right? These are not surprising data. Here's some data from the, from the Bushmen in the Kalahari. And we have equivalent data from Mexico uh, as well. So this is not, this is, this is typical of people who live forager lives. You can see there's absolutely no statistically significant increase in systolic or diastolic blood pressure in these populations. So don't tell me that it, you have to have blood pressure increases as you age. That's a completely false conception. <clears throat> um, it turns out also that People think that, you know, until recently, lives were nasty, brutish, and short. And it's true, hunter-gatherers do have very high infant mortality rates, but that doesn't really explain things very effectively. So this is a, a population curve, right, a, a, a population pyramid, a demographic pyramid. And comparing the average for the world in 2004 with the demographic pyramid of the Hadza hunter-gatherers. This is a, probably the most studied hunter-gatherers in the world today. They live in Tanzania. And you can see that the Hadza have a much higher juvenile mortality rate, infant mortality rate, than people for the world average. But actually, in terms of their demographic pr profile, 
they're actually comparatively living longer than people from the rest of the world. In fact, studies show, there's a wonderful paper by Mike Gervin and, uh, and, uh, and Hilary Kaplan showing that if you, once you take infant mortality out of the equation, the modal age of death of hunter-gatherers is between 68 and 78. So if you survive childhood, actually, as a hunter-gatherer, you live to, to be pretty old. And so in this population, for example, a full quarter of the population is post-reproductive, a higher percentage than the, than the world average. So what's causing um, um, all this death and illness uh, in this world versus the one over there? Because these folks are dying mostly from infectious diseases. Well, there's lots of studies of this, and you've probably seen these kinds of statistics before, but we well know that, that the major, major cause of death in the United States is heart disease, and the second leading cause is cancer. Basically, two-thirds of the people in this room will die from either cancer or heart disease, and I'm, you know, I'm not accepting myself. Um, but then when you actually try to, those are the, that's what's written on the death certificate, but you try to figure out what are the, the actual causes of cancer and heart disease, and you try to actually look at that. And this is actually one of the most cited papers in the world, Mock did it all, uh, 2000. And tobacco is still number one, although it's just creeping now. There's a competition now. But number two is physical inactivity and poor diet. And, and the reason that these aren't separated is that they, so, they co-vary so strongly. There's no, people have not figured out statistically how to really separate um, uh, um, 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 uh, poor diet and, and, and inactivity, although there's some efforts. And here's one such example. So this is a study. So many of you probably know this famous study. It's, they publish like a paper a week still. Uh, it's run <coughs> through Walter Willett and his Frank and Frank Hu and others at the Harvard Medical School, excuse me, the School of Public Health. Um, so they've been following well over 100,000 women since 1974, I believe, or 76, and they've been collecting data on these individuals. They know everything. They know when they die. They know what they get sick from. They have self-reported data on diet and physical activity and all kinds of factors, right? And um, and what they're able to do is to sign um, a relative mortality rate. So this is the rate at which people are dying, rate at which these nurses are dying. And they, if you sign, if you normalize, so the, the, the nurses who are lean and active and give their, their rate of death as, as one, right, then you can compare people who are sedentary versus overweight uh, relative to those death rates. And you can see that being overweight increases your death rate between 87 to 92 percent. But being inactive, so being sedentary versus active when you're lean or sedentary versus active when you're overweight, increases your rate of death by approximately 50%. So being overweight is certainly more uh, dangerous to your lung, to your health than being inactive, but being inactive is still pretty darn important, okay? So it's pretty obvious. I love this photo. It's obviously photoshopped <laughs> or, or staged because nobody does this. Um, but, you know, it's pretty clear. Nobody knows. This is not a surprise to anybody on the planet that if we could get p people to be less overweight and we get them to be more physically active, we would save trillions of dollars, not to mention make people healthier, happier. But the problem is that that's the problem, right? We, everybody knows this. You don't need me telling you or your whatever. You, you, everybody knows this. This is, not a, this is not a hidden fact, right? The problem is that we struggle with this, right? 69% of U.S. adults are either overweight or obese. Um, People who try to go on diets, almost all diets fail. This is not news. We all know this. And as I said before, at least half of Americans um, are almost completely physically inactive. Yeah, this is probably also staged. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, you can find all sorts of great staged photographs on the Internet. Okay. So let's try to use our evolutionary perspective uh, to try to understand this problem. And remember, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of, um, of evolution, and I would say that health and disease in, is included. So let's break this problem down. The first is, um, why does the problem exist? And let's begin with the question of why is exercise so important for health? Now, not all of you are evolutionary biologists, so let's po apologies to those of you who are, but I'm going to do a, like a quick evolution 101. Natural selection is basically the outcome of three very simple non-controversial processes that occur all the time, right? <clears throat> There's variation. All of you look different to me, right? Some of those variations are heritable, and there's differential reproductive success, often but not necessarily driven by competition, right? So some of you in the room have you know, one kid, two kids, three kids, zero, this is in college campuses, some of you have zero kids, right? But at the, by the end of your life, you'll all vary in your reproductive success, and, if there are, and, the, emer and, the, and the outcome of the, the emergent property of all these three things is that there are going to be some of you who are going to pass on more, more, more genes to the next generation because you have heritable variations that make you better able to do that, and some of you will 
um, have fewer because, again, of genetic variation that will make you less able to have uh, reproductive success. So that's just the emergent outcome of variation, heritability, and differential reproductive success is natural selection. Whether we like it or not, it happens. It happens all the time, and it's still happening today. So anybody who says that natural selection has ceased to exist because of technology doesn't understand their evolutionary theory. So there are two key, concept, key concepts you need to understand to apply this to the problem we're thinking about. The first is that you need to know what an adaptation is and by an evolutionary biologist. For us, an adaptation is the relative ability, because we're all competing with each other, right? The relative ability to survive and transmit your genes to the next generation, right? And that is conferred by adaptations, which are useful features that are inherited and derived, they're novel, they're selected by natural selection, right? That promote your ability to have reproductive fitness, to promote your ability to have more offspring. Right? That shouldn't be too controversial, right? And when we apply that to, the, to, to diet and exercise, the problem is that most people think about it in a very simplistic way. Probably when, whenever I hear people who don't know much about evolutionary medicine ask me questions, the first thing they always ask me about is the paleo diet, which usually gets me kind of my blood pressure up, right? <laughs> I am not a fan of the paleo diet in many ways because, and primarily because as, as an evolutionary biologist, I can tell you the paleo diet is based on a really gross misunderstanding of evolutionary theory, which is that we didn't evolve to be healthy. We only evolved to be healthy to the extent that health promotes reproductive success. Sorry to say that, folks, but we also didn't evolve to be happy. We didn't evolve to be nice. We didn't evolve to be, you know, to be, to be good to each other. Uh, um, we evolved to have, the only thing natural selection cares about is how many offspring you have who survive and then reproduce. That's it. It's kind of depressing. So, um, and we evolved also to, to promote reproductive success under really challenging energy limiting conditions. And so this helps us think about now to answer those, these questions. So the first question really is, you know, why is exercise so important for health? Well, the first reason is that because of our evolutionary history, we evolved really important adaptations to be endurance athletes. So this is, this is a, one of my passionate sort of topics. And there's a, this is a long and complicated story, but I'm going to simplify it ridiculously to just a few slides. But um, we can start the story around six million years ago when we uh, diverged from our ape ancestors and, and we're more closely related to chimps than to gorillas. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of debates about just the nature of that last common, last common ancestor, but I will go to my grave uh, believing that that last common ancestor was probably pretty chimp-like. It was a forest-dwelling ape, primarily ate fruit. It was probably a knuckle walker. Um, and it was, um, and like other apes, it was good at speed and power and had almost no endurance. Right? If you ever want to wrestle a chimpanzee, don't. But if you want to race a chimpanzee over a long distance, you'll be fine. <laughs> um, chimpanzees are strong and powerful, but they have almost no endurance. And the, an important thing is that, we, that the, from the very get-go, the oldest fossils we have that are more closely related to us than chimpanzees are bipeds. And that transition followed a period of major climate change. And we know that Africa was cooling down. And when it cooled, we went from a more woodland habitat to more, excuse me, a more forest habitat to a more woodland habitat. Opening up in the environment, and what, what do chimpanzees and other apes like? They love fruit, right? They have to travel very short distances. So a typical chimpanzee walks two kilometers, maybe three kilometers a day to get all the fruit it needs. It spends half its day eating fruit. But, um, but as you live in a more open woodland environment, you have to travel farther in order to get the same amount of fruit. We know these creatures were still, well, were still fruit eaters. And so these first hominins appear to be bipeds, and we have pretty good data. So my team did some of this work. We actually got chimpanzees that were uh, retired from Hollywood. They had actually been previously abused chimpanzees, and we actually con uh, convinced the chimpanzees, asked them really, to wear oxygen masks. So this is no coercion here. And measured their oxygen consumption. And we can show that chimpanzees spend four times as much energy to use it to move a unit body mass uh, as a, um, a, a kilometer than, or a meter than, uh, than a human being. So one of the big adv advantages of being a biped is that as, as those environments open, you can travel farther to get your food. Being bipeds enable us to do that much more efficiently. That's a huge amount of energy. That's obviously a big selective benefit. And there's also some evidence that, um, and arguments that being bipedal also helped uh, hominins or early ancestors uh, feed more efficiently. Okay, fast forward a few million years. Again, I'm whizzing over a lot of complicated data. Um, more environmental changes occurring. This is, again, that graph before. This is time um, on the x-axis. This is temperature of the Earth's planet, of the Earth's uh, environment. And, and 
during this period between starting around 2.8 million years ago, we know the Earth started cooling again rather dramatically. And this had major effects in Africa, again, causing more drying out of Africa. In particular, we have the opening up of all of these grassland habitats. And if you're standing out there two million years ago or two and a half million years ago wondering what to eat for dinner and you have, a, you have ape ancestry and you're, you're trying to look in this landscape what to eat, what's the obvious thing to eat in this landscape? It's the zebra, right? So what happened was, and we know this pretty well from the evolutionary record, is there were two responses to these shifts. One was a group of hominins, which thankfully are not our ancestors and they went extinct. They're called the robust australopithecines and these are like cows on legs. They basically became adapted for eating really low quality diets. And uh, they lasted around 1.2 million years ago. They're gone. You don't have to worry about them. They're not your ancestors, they're your cousins. Our ancestors are the genus Homo. And we started going for the good stuff, right? We became high quality food specialists. Um, and, they, and we first started appearing around 2.8 million years ago. And really what this is about is the invention of a novel way of life called hunting and gathering, right? Which is not just not just hunting and gathering, though that's very important, that gathering tends to be extractive foraging. So instead of just you know, picking berries off plants, you're actually often digging for stuff. You're getting honey. You're getting resources that are high energy but not necessarily easy to get. But it also involves lots of cooperation. You can't make the system work unless you have food sharing and, and pair bonding. And also you require tool making and food processing. And you can't make the system work without that. And we actually just published paper uh, on just how important tools are for chewing, for example, in, in, in nature just a few months ago. So one of the questions that I'm really fascinated about is, in that transition, how did these early humans hunt? Um, the bow and arrow was invented only uh, 100,000 years ago. Just putting a, a stone point on the end of a stick was invented less than 500,000 years ago. Yet we were hunting, we were killing we were getting animals at least two and a half million years ago, maybe 3.3 million years ago. We have really good archaeological data that humans were actually hunting big, large animals like kudu and wildebeest two million years ago. How are they doing it without any technology? If any of you have ever been on safari, right, and you've decided, oh, I want one of those wildebeest, and you just like jumped out of the safari vehicle and thought you'd just go kill a wildebeest with your bare hands, well, just say that, I mean, your guides won't let you do it. It's not a good idea. Um, you'd be toast. First of all, the wildebeest would just kick you or you know, gore you with your horns, and you'd, you know, you're better off being a vegetarian. Um, but secondly, you wouldn't, I mean, how would you kill that animal, right? You have, without any kind of technology. You certainly won't be able to run it down. The world's fastest guy, right, Usain Bolt, who is just astonishing for a human being, right? He can run 10.4 meters a second for, for 100 meters. Uh, I'm sure, I mean, look, there's some runners in the room, but I don't think any of you are as fast as Usain Bolt. Um, right? um, but he can only do that for just a few seconds. He can't do that very far. Pretty much any animal out there in the, in the savanna can run twice as fast as Bolt for a lot farther. In fact, you can probably go find some of the sheep in the fields around here in Amherst who can run faster than Usain Bolt and for a farther. Right? So he's fast for a human, but he's not fast for an animal because, after all, he's only got two legs. And he can only produce power with two legs rather than four legs. That's just an immediate, inherent disadvantage of being a biped. So our hypothesis is that, um, and I published this with Dennis Bramble based on, a, uh, on some earlier proposition by Dave Carrier, um, is, that, um, is that we uh, evolved the ability to hunt through long distance running. And here's how it works. So this is a graph on, the, on which I've got speed on the x-axis. And I'm sorry, I put it in meters a second because that's how I tend to think. But I put here uh, at six meters a second, which is a four and a half minute mile as you run. <coughs> There are actually people on the planet, certainly not me, who can run a marathon at a four and a half minute mile. <clears throat> and, um, and I've got here, so this is the endurance range of humans, and this is the maximum uh, range of sprinting for humans. So we can again go, this is Usain Bolt, where you're at the end there. And I've got here the trot gallop transition for a dog, a, f a pony, and a full sized horse. <clears throat> and of course, these animals can, can gallop way faster than it's on this graph. But the important point is that. Trotting is, a, is an endurance gate for these animals. You cannot make these animals run long distances at a gallop. And so humans, like even me, like I'm a middle-aged professor, right? I can run above the trot gallop transition speed of a, of a greyhound for an entire marathon. I can actually pretty much match a, a, a pony. And over very long distances, people can actually run faster than the trot gallop transition speed of a horse. But it's even more important than that because the way we cool down is by sweating. We basically secrete water all over our bodies. And when that water evaporates, the phase shift releases a lot of energy, which cools the skin, which cools the blood below us. 
The way other animals cool is by panting, right? Uh, panting is, just, is also evaporation, but it's just in the oral cavity, and there's a lot less surface area there. And, so they, and, they, and the important thing is that they can only do that while trotting. If you get an animal galloping, there's a very famous studies that were done by, by my colleague Dennis Bramble but, and others, uh, which show that when an animal starts galloping, it's a seesaw gait, and it causes the guts to slam into the viscera uh, with the, each step. And so animals, once they're in a galloping uh, gait, can no longer um, uh, they, uh, pant in between their breaths. And if you want to test this hypothesis, take your dog for a run, go to a galloping speed, it shouldn't be too hard, and notice that your dog will not be able to pant while it's galloping. So if you want to take your dog for a really long run, run it at a trot. But if you want to kill your dog, take it at a gallop, which I don't recommend, particularly on a hot day. And that's actually what um, humans have, do. They do what's called persistence hunting. So they do this in places like the Kalahari, where they'll take an animal. The bigger, the better, because bigger animals are, get hotter faster. Right? And now in the middle of the day, when it's super hot, they'll chase it over long distances. They're not running the whole time, because they're chasing it, making the animal gallop. Animal, animal overheat, the animal hide in the bushes basically, try to cool down, but if you can find that animal and chase it again, its body temperature will go up. And so it's a mix of walking and running, chasing and tracking, and eventually the animal, here's a kudu being chased by a, by a, wilde, by a, by a, by a bushman, this kudu is now collapsing of hyperthermia. It's, it's actually it's elevated its core temperature to a lethal level, and it's now collapsing, and this guy can walk up and just with his spear uh, kill it on his own. He's only, he's not run a marathon, he's actually run about a half a marathon, he's one their half. And they're not, when they're running, they're actually not running very fast, they're doing like about a 10 minute mile when they're running, they're not going all that fast at all. It's not so hard to do. And, and here he's using a spear, but in the area where I've been working recently, the, the, the Copper Canyon, they don't even bother with a spear because there's so many rocks all over the place. When, they, when the animal is dying, they just pick up a rock and dispatch it with a rock. Um, okay. So, it's a, it's a, and, and by the way, just on Saturday, um, just to kind of put this into, into, into to do some proof testing, I actually ran a, the man against horse race in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, here's a picture of me taken by a, by a colleague who also ran the, 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 the marathon. And this is the beginning of the race, and the horses were all passing us. Um, but I actually, there were 53 horses in this race, and I actually beat 40 of them. So, so um, and I'm not a spectacular runner, so it really is true. It was, it was over a 25-mile race. So it's not completely made up. And the important thing is that it doesn't actually cost that much. Running is about 40, maybe 50 percent, depending on how good a runner you are, more expensive than walking. So if you were to walk 15 kilometers, you'd spend 650 calories. If you run that distance, you're spending about 1,000 calories, which is basically the difference between a Big Mac and a Big Mac plus fries, which means that essentially if you basically add the fries in, you can get a kudu, right? Because you can't walk down a kudu, but you can run down a kudu. So I think it's pretty good, right? Um, and um, now today, of course, we don't do this very often. I mean, I did it last weekend. I, we didn't kill the horses, by the way, at the end. Um, but, um, but we know from ethnographic evidence that this actually was common all over the world. We have data from almost every place on the planet um, that people used to do it. Even in Siberia, all over North America, South America, there's lots and lots and lots of ethnographic evidence that people used to do this. Of course, we don't do it anymore, and we've kind of forgotten how, how and why we can do this. And this is another lecture, but we also have abundant evidence throughout our bodies, literally from our heads to our toes, all kinds of features that make us really good at long distance running. We have short toes, work actually that I did here with Joe Hamill here at, at UMass. We actually published a paper together on this. Our short toes help us be runners. We have springs in our arches. We have Achilles tendons. We have big butts. We have, you know, all kinds of features. Uh, that some of which have no effect on walking, which help make us really good long distance runners. And interestingly enough, these features all show up around uh, 1.5 to 2 million years ago in, the, in Homo erectus. And, and, the, and all of us have these features. And if you say you're not a good runner, it's because you haven't really tried. You have all the anatomy you, to do it if you want to. Okay. But it's not just running. I'm a little bit obsessed with running. I love running. But it's not just running, right? People in the Paleolithic, they also had to you know, walk a lot. They had to, and when they're walking, they're carrying babies and food. They have to dig for several hours. They're, 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 they're processing food. Men are climbing trees and throwing. Our, we evolved to be athletes, right? We evolved to be very physically active. Which brings us to question two, which is why is physical activity so important in health? Not only do we evolve to be athletes, we also evolved to adapt capacity to demand. This is a very important point, right? So there are two kinds of adaptation to think about. And I already gave you the definition of adaptation via natural selection. This is a herit heritable feature that improves your reproductive success, right? 
And those are the, those are the features we often think about, right, when we, uh, as an evolutionary biologist, right? So, for example, some of us uh, have ancestors who evolved uh, uh, the ability to continue to digest um, la lactose um, as adults, right? So that's an adaptation that actually evolved since the origins of agriculture, actually seven times independently, that enable some of us, but not all of us, right, to continue to drink milk as adults, right? That's a classic example of an adaptation. But there are also another, other kinds of adaptations which evolve or, or occur through phenotypic plasticity. These are these non-heritable adjustments between our, our, our body's capacities and demands, right? So we, have, we, we adapt our physiology or our anatomy to particular environmental stress. So, for example, having a, a tan, right, when you expose to the sun, to UV lights, you don't pass on a tan to your children, but you pass on perhaps the ability to tan to your children, right? That, that, that dose response, right, that, f that ability to, to adapt to that capacity to demand uh, is, is under selection. And we call this phenotypic plasticity. Phenotype is, is all the expression of your genotype in your body, and plasticity is the ability to change. So phenotypic plasticity is very important. And, and, the, and the key thing is, of course, that phenotypic plasticity in response to exercise is absolutely vital, right? Because we uh, use it when you exercise, you're adjusting capacity to demand. That's why you can turn from a wimp into, into Captain America, right? Uh, well, he took some kind of serum or something, but you know, that's a <laughs> little, bit, uh, little bit extreme. But the question is, why not just simply have excess capacity? Why, I mean, why do you have to have this phenotypic plasticity? Why not just, why, not just, why can't we all be at Captain America's, right? Okay. And the answer to that is because of energy allocation. You can't spend the dollar twice. You can't spend a calorie twice. You can't spend a second twice. And, and because of that, we have lots of trade-offs. And one of those trade-offs, and one of the most important trade-offs, is how we use energy. If you think about it, life is about get, taking an energy and using that to make more life. And you can only spend a calorie once, right? So you need to spend some of those calories to grow your body. You need to spend a fair amount of them all the time to maintain your body. And you can spend some of it doing stuff, being active. And then finally, what natural selection really cares about is how much you have left over to spend on reproduction. And since all that natural selection really cares about is reproduction, any time you can turn energy from any of these things towards reproduction, selection will favor that, because that's all it cares about. It doesn't care if you're nice or happy or healthy, or tall or good looking. It cares about how many um, offspring you have. And we see this all the time. A very obvious example is muscle, right? Muscle's really expensive. You're all just sitting there. You're not using very many muscles right now. Um, but those muscles are consuming about 20% of your metabolic rate right now, just sitting there, just being there. They've all that hunk of muscle on your body, right? And, and that's costly, right? You don't want to use, you don't want to have from a reproduction, from an evolutionary standard, you don't want to have any more muscle than you need, right? Which is why we need to exercise in order to gain muscle. And if you stop exercising, you lose it, right? That's an obvious adaptation to, a, to, to, have, um, to have energy allocation, right? Yeah, so Arnold Schwarzenegger is a little bit unfair, but there we are. Um, I don't have a picture of Donald Trump when he was a, when, when he was a, when he was lifting weights, so um, which I don't think he ever did. But anyway, um, another example, what Professor Holt studies is is bones, right? The very famous studies which compare the arms of tennis players on the left versus the right, the swinging versus non-swinging side, and the side that they they, they use to swing the racket, you know, it's obviously genetically the same as the other side, right? They have much, much, much thicker bones because they're, 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 they're adapting their skeleton to that. But there's a cost to that. You have to, there's a metabolic cost. There's an energetic cost. There's lots of reasons not to do it any more than you need it. It's actually true of every single system of the body, as far as I can tell. It's true of our heart, our cardiovascular system. So the more you exercise, the more you exercise your heart and enlarge your ventricles and lower your systemic blood pressure. It affects our digestive and endocrine systems in terms of glucose transporters and all kinds of other uh, functions. It affects our immune system. Um, there's actually no system in the body unaffected, even the brain. There was lots of data on this. Physical activity upregulates all kinds of growth factors in the brain. So neurotropic growth factors, which, for example, are very impor important in, in neuronal um, uh, uh, growth, as well as neuronal maintenance, BDNFs, are upregulated by exercise. Um, neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, and I can tell you from Saturday, endocannabinoids, all kinds of good stuff, are upregulated by, um, by physical activity. And not surprisingly, there's abundant data. I mean, there are hundreds of studies which show that people who exercise more are happier. 
they're healthier, they have better sex, they sleep better, they're wealthier. There's nothing that isn't probably upregulated um, by physical activity. They have less depression, less anxiety, and that's of course because of these dopamine and serotonin uh, um, 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 upregulation. But remember, although it's nice that all those things happen because of exercise, we, that's not why we evolved to exercise, right? We are, these, these, these responses didn't evolve to make us necessarily healthier. They evolved to promote our reproductive success um, and also to prevent excess capacity because excess capacity will diminish your reproductive success. It's energy wasted. Which then raises the next question, which has been why, so that explains sort of why we need physical activity in order to develop capacity. So why is it that physical inactivity uh, causes pathology? And the answer to that is that because there never was selection for people to be physically inactive, right? Just as we, we never evolved adaptations to lose weight very effectively, because you know, there weren't you know, people on diets in the Paleolithic, there were no physically inactive people until recently. Um, and so I would argue, in fact, that the last book that I wrote, The Story of the Human Body, is really about this question of mismatched diseases. I would argue that a lot of the diseases that we're getting, including the diseases that result from physical inactivity, are what we call mismatched diseases. These are diseases that are more common or more severe because our bodies are inadequately or imperfectly adapted to the novel environmental conditions in which we now live. So <clears throat> let's talk about how that matches for physical activity. And one way of doing that is to, first question is to ask, how much less do we ex exercise today than in the past? There are many, many ways of measuring this. In fact, I was talking with Professor Holt today earlier about this. One very simple measure is what's called the physical activity level, the PAL. It's just basically your total energy you spend in the day divided by how much energy you would spend if you were essentially asleep in bed doing nothing, okay, your, your basal metabolic rate. And um, we know from extensive studies of hunter-gatherers that their physical activity levels are about 1.9. So they're basically it's about spending as much act energy being active as they are taking care of their me met metabolic processes. Subsistence farmers are just a little bit higher. They have to work a little bit higher than hunter-gatherers. There's a lot of variation around this. But post-industrial Americans who have desk jobs have PALs of about 1.5 to 1.6. That's at least a 15 to 20% reduction. It's one of the biggest transformations in how we use our bodies, and the most rapid transformations that ever occurred in our evolutionary history. And just to put that into perspective, if you use 20% less energy compared to a, a, a hunter-gatherer, that means you're, you're spending 400 to 600 calories a day less being physically active per day. That's a lot of energy. It's an enormous, enormous shift in our biology that um, has transformed our biology in all kinds of ways. And I would argue, and I'm not the only person to argue, that a lot of the diseases that kill us today and that make us sick today are mismatched diseases. Not all of them are caused by physical inactivity, but, um, but a lot of them are strongly related to physical activity. Alzheimer's, for example, which afflicts 11% of the country today, the st biggest th predictor of whether or not, you know, the, 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 the strongest environmental variable that affects your probability of getting Alzheimer's is how physically active you are. It actually explains about a third of the variance in Alzheimer cases, a third. It's by far, and there's no gene that comes any, anywhere is that close. Depression, fatty liver syndrome, high blood pressure, metabolic syndrome, osteoporosis, I mean, it goes on and on and on, type 2 diabetes. All of these are affected by physical activity. Everybody argues about just how much physical activity is preventive. Uh, there's no single number, but this, these are numbers that come from the American College of Sports Medicine. These are consensus estimates of how much less likely you are to get certain diseases just from having 150 minutes per week. All right, that's what these estimates come from. They're not exact estimates, obviously, and they're complicated, and they're different for sex and age, and et cetera. But they estimate, for example, 150 minutes a week decreases your, your chances of heart disease by 40%, stroke by 27%, diabetes by 50%, high blood pressure by 50%, breast cancer, which many people don't know, um, but this is very clearly shown uh, by quite a few studies, by 20 to 50%, colon cancer, Alzheimer's, depression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, which raises the question, if exercise is so good for us, then finally, can an evolutionary perspective help explain why so many of us avoid, us avoid it? And again, we have to go back to our principle, right? Which is that natural selection didn't necessarily adapt us to be healthy, but to have as many offspring who survive as possible because of energy allocation. And there's a, here's a very visceral evidence for this, okay? This is a very famous study. I'm sure you teach this in class. This is the famous Gambian uh, Nutritional Intervention Program. It was started by the Brits 
British, excuse me, I shouldn't be, be uh, in the 1960s, British Medical Research Council. And it, there's, it's well known that in, in places like the Gambia, there are a lot of uh, women who have uh, babies who are underweight. And underweight babies have much higher probability of all kinds of medical problems and of dying young and having various kinds of diseases as, uh, later on in life. So there's a strong, um, a strong um, benefit to making sure that women don't give birth to underweight infants. So what they did was they decided to do a, a nutritional supplementation program. To, uh, to women in the Gambia, and they gave them kind of, a, kind of like protein bars, right, um, with um, an extra uh, 725 calories a day um, and between 50 to 100 percent more protein than they were getting in their diet. And the expectation was, of course, that this would solve the problem of low birth weight babies, but they weren't thinking about evolution, right, because what does evolution care about? How many offspring you have, right, who survive and reproduce. And the result was that the average birth weight of those babies went up by only 50 grams, there was no change in how much milk output the mothers had, and instead they decreased their interbirth interval, so the spacing between babies, by about a third. That's exactly what you predict from natural selection, right? It's, we're not evolved to be healthy, we're evolved to have as many offspring as possible, and so they're, they're, they were doing exactly, you know, their bodies were doing, of course there's nothing intentional here, we're doing exactly what natural selection predicts. I would say it's no different for exercise, right? Anytime you can take energy from physical activity and devote it towards reproduction, you're going to win from an evolutionary perspective. And we are clearly selected to do that. So to remind you, average hunter-gatherer every day walks, you know, five to f nine to 15 kilometers. Just to put that into perspective, if you walk nine kilometers a day, you can walk from LA to Washington, D.C. in a year, right? That's actually average for a hunter-gatherer female, to walk from LA to Washington, D.C. in a year. We think that's a ridiculous amount of walking, but that's what we evolved to do daily basis. We evolved to, to spend a lot of the time digging, right? We spent a lot of time preparing food and carrying babies, right? <clears throat> but we always had to do so in, in conditions where energy balance was limited, right? We're, we're struggling to get enough food. So there recently there have been studies on, on the Hadza and other hunter-gatherers, which show, I'm going to show some data just from males, right? So average male Hadza is 51 kilos, and we know from doubly labeled water experiments, so these are very, this is gold standard data, that they're getting about 2,600 calories a day. And if you then figure, estimate their basal metabolic rate, which is a little tricky to do, but you can sort of do it from fat-free body mass, you can figure out that they're actually spending about 30 calories per kilo per day being active. That's an estimate. Could be wrong. But it's probably not horribly wrong. Your average American, and by the way, this is a, according to the CDC, what your average American looks like um, in just his underpants. <coughs> Um, is getting 2,900 calories a day, weighs a lot more, 75 kilos, and the active energy budget is about 17 calories per kilo per day. So we're spending about half the amount of energy per kilo per day. So, so we evolved in conditions of energy expenditure, and the result is that when you're a hunter-gatherer and you're not being physically active to get energy to feed yourself and your offspring, what should you be doing? nothing. <laughs> and indeed, if any of you ever had a chance to go into a village of subsistence farmers or hunter-gatherers, if they're not doing something, they're sitting on the ground just doing nothing. They're gossiping, talking, grooming, combing each other's hair, doing some food preparation. But people aren't, I mean, I'm, a, I'm the only person who goes out for a run in the morning, and they think I'm a complete lunatic when I go for a run in the morning, right? They, they, they don't understand that. And we still see this in our own environment, right? Um, people do, this is a, there's a whole industry of people who do this. You know, if you go to a mall, well, you're in Amherst, so there are no malls here, right? But in Boston, there are plenty of malls, right? <clears throat> you know a mall when they have a staircase next to an escalator? And there are people who just sit there at the bottom of the staircase and escalator and count how many people take the escalator versus the staircase. And the worldwide average, anyone want to guess what percentage of people take the escalator to the fitness center? Yeah, it's, it's 95%. <clears throat> and if you put a sign at the bottom of the stairs saying, please take the stairs, you know, for, it's good for your health or something, that falls to about 90%. Yeah. Right. I bet if you did the same experiment, I don't think NSF is going to give me money to do this, but if you put an escalator in the Kalahari Desert, the Bushman would take the escalator there too. It makes sense, right? If we can spend, save energy, it's an innate, it's an instinct to, to do that. There's one key and extremely important exception, and that's play, right? Play is a very important adaptation. It's unnecessary in a way. Physical activity as, ch as children, which, which you helps develop physical capacities, helps develop skills, um, helps develop 
physiological capacities necessary to be an adult to do all the physical activity that was necessary. So that, that leads to the final bit that I want to talk about very briefly, which is can we use evolutionary data and evolutionary theory to find a better solution? Because clearly the approaches that we're using today are not working, right? With, I mean, I just showed you the information already. So I'd like to come up with, give you three, I think, three points that I think derive from an evolutionary perspective related to this epidemic of inactivity. The first is that contrary to what we are repeatedly told over and over and over again, a lot of the diseases that we are told we're going to get are not inevitable, right? That, <coughs> um, that most of these chronic mismatch diseases um, uh, don't have to occur. Right? Th these are, um, uh, th these are, they occur more commonly with aging, but they're not actually caused by aging. Um, and um, so, um, um, so we can, and there's plenty of studies which show that you can drastically reduce the prevalence of these diseases through diet, through exercise, through not smoking, all the stuff that nobody needs to tell you that you should be doing. All right, that's the easy one. The second, more complicated problem is that a lot of the symptoms that we are treating are actually adaptations, but we mistake symptoms for adaptations. And a perfect example is dieting and exercise, right? So we all know what happens, right? When you, when you diet or try to exercise more to try to lose weight, you get what's called... Um, you know, you get the symptoms of having negative energy balance, right? You get fatigued and grumpy and your, your appetite goes up, right? You become uncomfortable. People get depressed and irritable, etc. cetera. Um, and that's because these are adaptations. These are ancient, ancient adaptations to avoid being in negative energy balance because being in negative energy balance means that you're lowering your reproductive success, right? Um, so here's what happens, right? You go into negative energy balance either because you're dieting or you're exercising too much or something like that, which means you're taking in fewer calories than you're expending, right? What happens? Your stress levels go up, which increases cortisol. Cortisol causes you to increase your appetite. It causes you to redistribute fat from subcutaneous stores to visceral stores. Visceral fat, belly fat, is highly inflammatory and, and bad for you. It causes you to want to be less active, um, which then... Um, feeds it back into this into the circle, right? So you so we get this kind of vicious circle caused by negative energy balance. And as a result, when we when people have a hard time dieting or losing weight, um, we make them feel bad, but actually they're doing exactly what their bodies evolved to do. And it's and it's and it's and we have to stop blaming and shaming people for being in, unable to lose weight because they're trying to fight against thousands, you know, you know, millions of years of adaptations that prevent us from being able to lose weight. Uh, it's, it's, it's a serious problem. And then finally, we're asking people to make choices that we never evolved to make, right? As I said before, the reasons we evolved to be physically active were really only two, right? We evolved to do it because we had to, right, to get food for dinner, or we evolved to be physically active at, when we're young in order to develop the capacities, right, and to and develop our, our skills to, in order to be physically active. And so the obvious solution to this problem is to make physical activity both fun and necessary, which is why we have physical education in schools, right? Except, well, here in Massachusetts, we've, we've screwed ourselves, right? So Massachusetts general law, I'm just going to read you the law here, um, says that physical education shall be taught as a required subject in all grades for all students. That's the law in Massachusetts. Except in 1996, the Massachusetts Board of Education voted out any minimum requirements when we created MCATs and all that kind of crap, right? And the result is that now, this is a recent study from the Boston Globe, middle school students, right, are getting 1.28 hours a week, and high school students are getting 1.51 hours a week. And this is a Massachusetts state average, which is less than 40% of the recommended minimum. And of course, there's variance around that. So we have, we have gutted uh, in our curriculum uh, the very thing that our, our, our children need. Uh, physical activity that's both fun as well as necessary. It's also true at the college level. Um, do any of you know, by the way, which is the first college in the United States to require physical activity, uh, physical education? It's actually Amherst College right here um, in Amherst. Um, so, but my, I don't have data on Amherst College, but I have data on Harvard where I teach. So physical education at Harvard was a little bit, you know, we're always late for everything. So we started a few years after Amherst, but it was it required between 1920 and 19. And the requirements changed constantly. But it was voted out of existence in 1970, like in most colleges. So it used to be 100% of colleges in the U.S. required physical activity. Is there, is there one at UMass Amherst? Are you required to do physical activity? 
at UMass Amherst. Right. So only 40% of colleges now still have any requirement whatsoever. Um, and in fact, we know from data at Harvard that 20, only 25% of our students get 150 minutes a week. And by the way, 20% of our students are on athletic teams, which means that only 5% of the non-athletes <laughs> are getting activity. That's actually a kind of scary uh, statistic. And that's really bad because there's actually plenty of studies. They're all flawed, but you know, there are studies which show that the more physical activity you get in college, the, that's highly predictive of how much you get later on in life. There's problems of self-selection here, but this study, for example, showed that non-exercisers, almost all of them, remain non-exercisers after college. Exercisers are, are much more likely to be exercisers after college. So the, the obvious conclusion then is that, is that you know, we evolved to be athletes. We had to, be, to run and walk and throw and carry and do all those sorts of things. Uh, in order to survive, but we also evolved to avoid unnecessary ex exercise. And I would argue that an evolutionary perspective tells us that the only way we're going to solve this problem, right, is not, not through education, it's not through um, incentives, um, is that we're going to have to make um, uh, physical activity both more fun as well as, um, as well as more necessary. And if there's any one place that we really have to start, uh, it's with our schools and here in Massachusetts. Uh, that's in dire need of activity. So, so uh, I hope that uh, I've convinced you that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of uh, evolution, and that it also includes uh, our relationship between exercise and health. So thank you. And I'm happy to answer questions. Do we have time for questions? Um, anything that gets people to exercise is good. I mean, why, what's, I mean, as long as they don't, like, crash into cars while, you know, following their phones. Um, I think, you know, we, we, I mean, we just, in the modern world, we need to find ways to make exercise fun. And if it makes it more fun, sure, good. Anything to get people out of their seats. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, that's being considered more and more by, by employers, right? Uh, a lot of employers are now providing standing desks for employees, um, making, um, I mean, look, it's beneficial for employers. If, you get, if your physical activity, if your employees are being physically active, they're going to be less likely to get sick. Your health cost, care costs are going to go down. Their concentration levels are going to go up. Their mood is going to improve. I mean, it's a no-brainer for employers as well. Um, and, um, and um, you know, a, a lot of enlightened companies with big budgets like Google, et cetera, are doing everything they can to increase employee physical activity. Uh, a lot of other uh, companies are way behind. Part of the problem also is that we have strange, perverse incentives in terms of health care, right? Because of the way health care is provided, right? If, uh, let's just say I'm a particular health care provider and I provide, you know, gym memberships to, to, to people, right? And then they go switch health care providers then, you know, Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield is going to get the advantage of the money I spent. So we have, by having this kind of crazy healthcare system, we've disincentivized healthcare providers from, from, um, from, from also uh, promoting this. And the ones that seem to do the best job are the ones where they're, you know, the kind of the real complete HMOs tend to actually uh, have more of a financial incentive to promote exercise, like Kaiser, for example, in California. And they figured out, they, they save a lot of money by getting their, 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 their people on Kaiser to be more physically active, but Blue Cross Blue Shield has less of an incentive because of the way the healthcare is, is structured. So it's not just employers, it's also the healthcare providers as well. Yes? The question was, what do I think about raising insurance premiums on the overweight? I think we have to really be very careful about, again, as I said, blaming and shaming people for being, a, being overweight. Very few, um, People aren't overweight because they want to be overweight, and they have a hard time losing weight. And I think that's the wrong attitude. I think we have to help people pr prevent people from, from becoming overweight, and we have to do our best to help people who are overweight lose weight. But I think um, uh, if we go down that path, um, um, that's, a, that's really problematic. Good question. So the question is, what role do epigenetic factors? Um, they're, they're probably profound and plenty. Um, and, and, and we know, for example, there's increasing studies of, for example, the effects of, of exercise on methylation. So 
exercise has, I mean, there's actually a paper in, in Nature this week on, 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 on exercise on methylation. Those of you who don't know, methylation is when um, uh, it, it's a, a little sort of methyl group attaches to, to the genome where transcription occurs, and it can actually shut down, for the most part, transcription, and it has very strong effects on aging and all kinds of things. And, and, to, and but I don't know too many studies which have looked at how much those methyl groups are passed from one generation to the next, but there's certainly some evidence of it. Um, so there's no question that physically inactive not only affects your own body, but can also have non-heritable effects on your offspring. There's no question that, that occurs. Um, I don't know if there's any good studies which have measured just how much there is, because there's still, people are still trying to figure out what those epigenetic result consequences of exercise are, but it's a very active area of study. Great question. Great question. So, so I think, I mean, most of the physical, hundred, the groups that I've spent time with, um, I, think they en I think they do enjoy, I mean, it's hard to measure it, right, how much they enjoy it, but they don't, I've never, you know, are you having fun, you know, hunting or, you, uh, but they're, they're often very social activities. I mean, when people go hunting, they don't go alone. <clears throat> they usually go in groups. The time they've gone hunting with Hadza, always in a group, and, you know, there's times when it's very quiet and tense because, you know, Holler behind the, you know, the, the rock or something, and you have to be super quiet. But there's a lot of gossip. And when women, I'm losing. This. When women are are, are digging, they're, they're talking. Most physical activity is very social. I mean, one of the weird things we do today is, you know, go to a gym and see all these people plugged into their iPhones, and you know, on a, you know, sometimes on a beautiful day in this kind of fluorescent lit room, and it's just it's miserable, right? I don't know. But you know, if that's good what it takes, that's fine. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. So I think that people have it's been fun for people because it tends to be social, and social things tend to be fun. Um, but there's also other kinds of physical activity. So when they're when they're doing needless physical activity. Uh, source is dancing. All the cultures I've been to, dancing is really important. The, 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 the Hadza have these incredible dances. They're called the Peme dances, and they're, they're amazing. And they go on for hours and hours and hours and hours. Or the Taramara, where I work, I mean, the, pe some of the people have heard about their long-distance running, which is, by the way, grossly exaggerated. Um, but but the, the one thing that's not mentioned in that book, Born to Run, is their long-distance dancing. Wow. When they dance, they dance for days. They're also drinking for days, too. Um, <laughs> Um, so I think that, uh, that, um, that these sorts of physical activity have always been very social. Um, and of course, when they're social, they're fun. And, and I think that's part of that. You know, if you look at, if you ask anybody who does exercise uh, psychology, they will tell you that the most effective forms of exercise intervention are the ones that are social. And I think that's deep and ancient. Yes? Yeah, we're doing that right now uh, in the Copper Canyon. We're comparing people who are living traditional lifestyles versus those who are not. Absolutely, yeah. And, and the answer is that the ones who are exercising don't get hypertension, and the ones who become sedentary do. Yeah. 